message on uh, last night on the sovereignty of God and uh, Brother Tommy's message on seduction. And uh, the session uh, that we're going to look at at this point in time is found in page uh, 8 of your notes there on solitude. And we're looking at, this, at solitude, which plays, a, I believe, a very important part in our walk with the Lord and everything that we do. You know, we can have the understanding of the sovereignty of God and we can have... Um, uh, the different standards and different uh, things that we do in our life. We can have the different activities that we have and, and uh, faithfulness to church services. We can be in Sunday school in the morning and we can be on the bus route and we can uh, sing in the choir. We can clean the church. We can do all different types of things and, and feed the poor and all those wonderful events and all those are fine in, in, in their place. And we can have all the knowledge of the sovereignty of God, the knowledge of, uh, of, of not of, of making certain that we uh, must suppress uh, the temptations when they come across our path. But if we don't have the solitude, and if we don't have our personal walk with the Lord, where it needs to be, we're all in deep trouble. We might as well just throw it all out the window because we get that strength in order to have to, to ward off those temptations. We get the strength and the knowledge to have understanding of what God wants to do in and through our life through our personal Bible reading and our devotion to Him and our prayer life with our Heavenly Father. That's where we get our strength. I receive the knowledge of God. I receive wisdom for my Bible reading and my uh, my Bible reading, and I understand that through the preaching of His Word and, and and through my devotions to the Word of God. But my personal prayer time, my devotion to Him on a daily basis, is where I get the strength to do anything that I'm going to do for Jesus Christ. And I'd like you to turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 39. We're going to continue looking at this uh, subject of solitude. Genesis chapter 39 is the subject of uh, Joseph, I should say. In chapter 39, if you'll stand with me again as, uh, as we read this, just let us stretch one more time. Genesis chapter 39, I'm just stretching it as we honor God's word. Genesis chapter 39 and verse 20. I'm going to be looking at a couple different passages here. Chapter 39 and verse 20, the Bible says, And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in the prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hands all the prisoners that were in the prison, and whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand, because the Lord was with him, and that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. And notice down in verse, uh, chapter 40 and verse 23, the Bible says, Yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forget him. Verse 1 of chapter 41, And it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he stood by the river. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would just continue to meet with us today, and I'm so thankful for the, the, the messages that you have blessed us with, Father, the, the ability to sing praises unto you. Lord, there's just nothing better than just hearing a room full of men lift up their voices and sing unto you and give you the praise that you so richly deserve. And I ask that you would help us, Father, to continue to... Uh, to think about how you would want to make changes in our life. And Lord, sometimes as we think about the, the solitude that we need to have in our life, our Bible reading, our prayer time, our time alone with you, it seems like it might be a daunting task because it, it, uh, it does take work. But we also know, Father, that's one of the most important items that we can do in our life is have a, a personal, intimate relationship with you. And so I just ask that you would give us clarity of thought this morning to help us to continue to seek your face. I pray that you would... Have your hand upon this message, and as you had it on the uh, previous messages, and Brother Rossner in a few moments, and Brother Jones, Lord, as he closes out, just guide us and bless us and direct us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, man. You see that talking about solitude, we were going over these, these uh, uh, subject lessons as we were meeting in the, a couple times before, starting up in January, uh, we began meeting, and we were looking at the sovereignty, talking about the sovereignty of God, and and the seductions, and we go through these all kind of go along in hand, hand in hand. Uh, you know, of course, we understand the sovereignty of God. We understand that He has a will for us, and His will is perfect. And His, his grace is sufficient. And we understand that there's going to be trials and difficulties that come across our path through the form of seductions. And, and there's temptations out there in this world. The devil wants to destroy us because he hates us. He hates you. He wants nothing to do with us and anything that has to do with our Heavenly Father. But here on this session, I want to look at solitude because that's what's going to give us the strength, and of course, to, to be victorious in our walk with Jesus Christ. This, this area right here, our, our Bible reading and our prayer time, is what is of utmost importance if we're going to see anything done for the cause of Jesus Christ. And it's not the most popular 
uh, 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 thing to talk about or to do because I, I would reckon that prayer time is one of the most difficult things that we try to tackle in our lives to have an adequate amount of prayer time. If we were to take a poll this morning and say, how many of you think you've prayed enough or your prayer life is sufficient, even the most, even the person who prays the most in this auditorium would be willing to admit to say, boy, I could probably spend just a little bit more time with my heavenly yeah. father. Yeah. That quiet time alone with him with no distractions and no and, and nothing hindering me, just that intimate relation that, that we have with him in our quiet in our quiet time, in our prayer time, is one of the, the most important times of our day. And uh, our Bible reading where we get the, the wisdom and direction from the Lord. And as we look at this subject called solitude, and, and we look at this session right here, uh, right off the bat, we don't know one likes to think of the word solitude, and we don't think it's a good word. We're often associated, uh, we, we look at the word solitude, and we think it, uh, of it as a bad thing. And, and under cer certain situations, uh, it is a bad thing. When someone goes to prison, or the roster was telling me when he was in prison, that uh, they don't want to prison <laughs> solitude. It's a bad thing. It's difficult. You probably skipped out, didn't you? Where is it? Oh, in the back. Again. And so, uh, you know, uh, so solitude, we look at a correctional facility, it can be used to punish those. But Webster's definition says, in 1828, your notes there, it says that solitude is loneliness, a state of being alone, a lonely life. Loneliness, he says, remoteness from society, a lonely place, a desert. Now, as we see in our text this morning, solitude doesn't have to be a bad thing. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but a wonderful gift from God to help us in our daily walk. Solitude, whether we look at it in the, in the form or in the relation of, of having quiet time with our Heavenly Father, it is the most important time that you'll spend in the day. The most important time. It's the most Amen. wonderful thing that you'll experience in your life as a born-again believer when you get away with the Lord and you just spend some time with Him. Have you ever had that happen to you during your day or during a time in your life when and things were going a little bit haywire, and he's like, man, I just, need, I just need some time alone with the Lord. I just need to get alone and pray. I, I just need to spend some time with him, reading my Bible and going over the scriptures and having that solitude, having that time with him. So I want to just tip you off this morning. Uh, I want to look at uh, a solitude two different ways. Uh, I want to look at the need or the necessity of solitude in our walk with the Lord. The need or the necessity of solitude in our walk with the Lord. Again, that's that tremendous, that necessary that required part of our life where we spend quality uh, time alone with Him. And then secondly, I want to look at solitude and uh, look at solitude as what the Lord will often have to do to the born again believer to help us start having that solitude, that time alone with Him. And He's done that to me in my life. I remember back in, I think it was 1991, I was not serving the Lord and I was doing that which was wrong. I made poor decisions as it pertained to alcohol and ungodly living. And I was at the funeral home in uh, Wichita, Kansas, and I had had a bad night the night before, and, and I put myself in a bad situation, and I should have had, I should have been beaten half to death, is what I should have done, but God, His grace, was working on me, trying, and getting me back uh, to serve Him where I needed to be, and I should have been, I should have been severely maimed, is what should have happened, but God had His hand on that situation, I was spared, and I was sitting in the funeral home that next morning, hungover, and I was thinking, this, this is not what it's all about. I was still fearful, I was afraid, I was I was miserable, I was, I was just I was struck down, I just I was at the bottom of the bucket, you could say, with nowhere to look but up. God took me to a, a, a place of solitude, he took me to a place where there, where there seemed like there was nowhere to go but up. And that's when I finally said, you know what I think I'll do? I think I'll start developing my relationship with the Lord. And so we can look at solitude two different ways. Number one, we can do it voluntarily, we can do it because it's of necessity. We can do it because it's the right thing to do. If we're going to have any type of walk with the Lord, have any victory in our life, you're going to spend time alone with Jesus Christ on a daily basis. Or we can go for part two, and the Lord's going to put us in that place where we're going to cry out to Him. And we shouldn't have to be there in the first place because of our walk with Him. And so oftentimes it takes a place, these, these times when He puts us in a solitude or allows things to happen in our life in the form of an illness or a form of a loss of job or poor finances or marital problems or you're in a funeral home, well, well, maybe not a funeral, but you're at the job site and, and, and you're thinking, I'm just done with, what, with the way that my life is going. Sometimes it, it's whatever it takes to get you and me to realize our need for solitude for quiet time with the Lord. Yeah, amen. Now, why does the Lord require this? Why, why does He want this solitude from you and from me? Why does He want that quiet time? 
Uh, why would he allow trials to come across our path so that we would turn to him? Well, I would submit it's because the Lord wants to do something great and mighty in your life and in my life. Yeah. He wants to do something wonderful for you and for your family, and he wants to build you, and he wants to grow you. And we know in Romans chapter 8, he's working uh, all things together for good in your life, and we know that he's trying to conform you to the, dear, to the image of his dear son, Jesus Christ. And he's working, and he's, he's working on these things in, in your life, and he's just begging you and yearning for you to come, and he's wooing you to come and just spend some time alone with him on a daily basis. In our Bible reading and our prayer time. Because he wants to do something fantastic in your life as it relates to you, as it relates to your family. And I would submit that that is the main purpose right there. We continue in the life of Joseph where we find him in, in unfavorable conditions and no fault of his own. I mean, he was in a bad situation here. He was mistreated by his brothers, as, as Brother Nat spoke about, and, and then he was seduced, as uh, Brother, Nat, uh, Brother Tommy Thompson uh, preached about, and un unjustly accused by Potiphar's wife. And now we find Joseph in solitude. And something we need to understand about Joseph was is that Joseph wasn't in difficult times or in this trial of his life because of disobedience. He, he was a just man. I'm talking about he was a godly man. Brother Nance talked about that last night. He was a picture, a type of Jesus Christ. And so he was doing that which was right, but yet now he's in solitude. Or yet now he's in an unfavorable situation. And, and, and so he was in this situation because the Lord was preparing him for something great. And he wanted Joseph to learn a few, a few lessons in the solitude. And so sometimes we think, okay, you know what, I, I better do my, we might think, well, I better read my Bible. I better spend time in prayer because I don't want the chasing hand of God upon me and to, and to force me to have to do that or get my attention. But sometimes the Lord even puts us in solitude, even the godly men among us, to help us grow and to do even greater things in our life. And sometimes he just wants to pull us aside and say, you know what, I, I want to do something even spectac spe more spectacular in your life. And let me ask you this question. Just what is the Lord wanting to do in your life today? Just what, are they, what, what is going on in your life, in your home life, with your job situation, with your children, with your finances? What is going on in your life today that God wants to do something about? And what is he going to have to do to get our attention to get that done? And so we see that in the life of Joseph right here. And, and, and sometimes we don't know what's going on or what the Lord wants to do. And perhaps it's because we've not spent time asking him in the quietness of our prayer closet. Amen. And so it, it's a truth that we need to understand. And if we don't get anything else from the message this morning, understand this simple fact that every great man of God, you can write this down, every great man of God spends time in solitude with the Lord. Right. Every great man of God spends sol time in solitude with the Lord. Spends time in their Bible reading and spend time in their prayer life. And I'm not just talking about a minute or two of a prayer here and reading one verse here. I'm talking about spending a good amount of time in their Bible reading and in their prayer time in the relationship with the Lord. Every great man of God, you mark it down throughout history, when you've seen men of God do great and mighty things, it's because they've spent time alone with the Lord and he's able to get a hold of their heart. Why is it that we're not seeing great miracles take place in our life? Why, why don't we have the happiness in our homes and why are we struggling from time to time with different cir circumstances and situations? Well, I would submit that our walk with the Lord isn't where it needs to be. Amen. I'm just saying that, that, that our walk with the Lord, well, I'm struggling with temptations. I'm struggling with that. what Brother Tommy mentioned. I'm struggling with this. I'm struggling with that. Well, I'm going to come back and say, how's your walk with the Lord? How's your Bible reading and your prayer life? Right. Now, I'm telling you what the folks of Faith Baptist Church know that when they come in for counseling into my office. One of the very first things I ask them when they start talking, I say, okay, hold on just a second. Where are you in your Bible reading and where are you in your prayer time? Because that'll tell me a lot about what's going on in your life. That'll tell me a lot about what God is able to do or what he's not able to do in your life as it pertains to your relationship with your wife or your children or your job or your finances. How's your quiet time with the Lord? How's that solitude going on in your life? What, what's happening? Where are you in your Bible reading? And so you will never find a great man of God. I'm just telling you, you will never find a great man of God, a great husband, or a great father, or a great church member who fails to spend time alone with the Lord. Right. Never. It's just not going to happen. We can fake it, and we can pretend, and we can put on the airs, you know, we can dress the way we want, need to dress, and we can say the things that we need to say, but we're going to be lacking great power in our life right. if our walk with the Lord, if our, if our time with Him is missing. Just mark it down right there. There'll be a superficial buzz. Or there'll be a superficial look to us. And it will look like we have all of our ducks in a row. 
<laughs> sometimes, you know, we joke around. My, we, Nina read this somewhere, and so we joke around with the kids when we get out of the car. When the kids, kids are bailing out of the car, we'll say, remember, we're a nice, happy family, or something like that. We're a nice, happy family. Don't forget that when we're getting out. You know, we need to show everyone, tell everyone, we're a nice, happy family, and stuff along those lines. And, and I'm talking about too many Christian men are walking around and saying, you know what, we're a nice, happy family. I'm a great spiritual man of God. And I'm, a, I'm, I'm doing this in the church, and I'm doing this in the church. So when we come to find out, we peel back the layers. There's no walk with the Lord at all. There, there's no power in the words that we're saying, and no power in the actions that we're doing. Hey, I'm all for beating the poor. But let's all do let's do it in the power of Christ. Amen. I'm all for cleaning the church. Let's do it in the power of Christ. Cleaning the church in the power of Christ. I'm just saying everything that we do, we need to have his hand upon it. Amen. We need to have his strength and we need to have his wisdom. And, and, and so sometimes we get so caught up. I'm doing this preaching, I'm doing this, I'm involved in this ministry. I'm involved in that ministry. I'm so busy here, and I'm so busy. Praise God, I'm all for that. But how, how are you doing in your walk with the Lord as it pertains to Bible reading? And prayer time. Those two keys right there. Well, I'm just too busy. Well, let me tell you, you're a little bit busier than God ever intended you to be right. if you're not able to spend time with Him. Right. Far busier than you've ever, than God ever, ever intended you to be. He's not going to fill your plate up with so many things that you're going to neglect your Bible reading and your prayer time. He's just not going to do it. I think Abraham Lincoln once said if he had that. If he had uh, three hours to cut down a tree, he'd spend the first two hours sharpening his axe. You know what I mean? I'm cut down the tree. <laughs> Let's get this thing going. Someone help me. No, no. Let's get first things first. Let's make certain that our walk with the Lord is where it needs to be. To face these temptations, these trials, to learn more about the wonderful mysteries of God. And then not only that, but to see, see what he wants to do in and through my life as it pertains to my family. Listen, guys. It was mentioned last night. You're the spiritual leaders of your home. You are the spiritual leaders. It's not mama, and it's not the 12-year-old kid, or it's not, the, it's not those four-year-olds still in diapers. Well, probably not in diapers. But it's not the little kid that's running around screaming and crying. And crying. You're the spiritual leader in your home. And if you're going to lead your home spiritually, you probably ought to ask the Lord what he thinks about it and what direction he wants you to go in. How am I going to get that figured out? Well, there's the difficulty again, isn't it? it there's the difficulty because we're not going to find it out Unless we get into this book, unless we get into our on our knees. Right. Moses, before he did anything for the Lord, spent 40 years on the backside of the desert. Paul, three years on the Sinai desert. Even our own Lord Jesus Christ spent nights alone with the Father. Nights alone with Him. What did these men know? Well, success in our walk demand, demands a time of solitude. And as we look at our notes, knowing that Joseph was a godly man, we're going to see... The, the three things that Joseph already had even before he went into solitude and these three things any man could ever want or hope for in this world the three things we already have Joseph number one had God's presence look in chapter 39 verse 21 chapter 39 verse 21 says but the Lord was with Joseph and, and that's one of the most comforting verses right there as you look at he just was uh, seduced and, and he said no and he was unjustly accused and thrown into jail and Potiphar said I believe in my wife rather than this just man and he got thrown into jail. It seemed like all was lost. But the Bible comes and tells us, the Holy Spirit shows us that the Lord was with him even in jail. Been abandoned by his brothers. He'd been falsely accused by his employer. Cast into the depths of prison. But those comforting words are found that the Lord was with Joseph. God's presence was just as important to Joseph in the prison house as it was in Potiphar's house. But not only did Joseph have his presence. Number two, Joseph had God's mercy. He had the Lord's loving kindness, as verse 21 continues. It gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And, and we know that mercy, too, is, what, is, is not getting what we deserve. God, Joseph had his, his uh, presence and he had his mercy. And then number three, Joseph had men's favor. In verse 22, and the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in prison. And whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. And uh, verse 23, the keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand because the Lord was with him. And that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. Not only did he have men's favor, but he also had men's forgetfulness there in chapter 40 and verse 23. He says, yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forget him. So on one end, 
you know, he had God's presence and he had God's favor or, or mercy, but not only that, he had men's favor, but also he had men's forgiveness. And what, what I'm understanding with that is, is it doesn't really matter what men think about us. If I'm serving Jesus Christ and putting him first, then I'm going to allow the Lord to take care of all the details. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, there's a little secret here. Just because you're a pastor of, a, of an independent uh, Baptist church doesn't mean everyone's always real happy with you. I don't know if you knew that or not. But, you know, you're not always the most favorite person on the block, you know, if you're a pastor. Or maybe you're a supervisor. Hey, you know, you're a supervisor and you're trying to take a stand for doing what's right. Or you're an employee or an employer, whatever it might be. Let me just say, just do what's right to make certain that your walk with the Lord is where it needs to be. And whether men like you or whether men don't like you, it's, that, that's okay. If you're going to be found accountable to the Lord, be found faithful to Him, if you'll please Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter what anyone else might think. Right? Just put the Lord first and serve Him. And, and so whether his circumstances were favorable or, or whether it took a turn for the worse, Joseph was not about to stop trusting God by faith. So he, if he already had these blessings, again, what was the point of the house? I, you know, that was one of these parts I was kind of struggling with as I was developing this message. I'm like, boy, you know, usually when we think of solitude, we think that we have to go to the low places or we need to get along with God so that we can have the blessings of God. But he already had them before he even got there. And I thought, well, I can take this message and work from the backwards this way. And no, I, I'm not smart enough for that. And so, you know, I was looking at this. So, so what was the purpose? What was the point of the prison house? What was the benefit of the solitude that the Lord was making him go through? I believe it was because the Lord was, again, preparing Joseph for an even greater ministry. An even greater ministry than he already had. I say a greater ministry. Well, he was ministering in the prison house. We'll see in just a second. It was a greater cause that, that could only be accomplished with a right relationship with God. And I just have to believe with my heart that God wants to do something even greater in your life today. I, mean, I don't know what it is. I don't know what God is doing with you, but there's no one here that's perfect and complete. And God, I believe, wants to do even something greater in my life. There's so many areas of my life that I just need help with and, and struggle with, and I need the Lord's hand upon me. I'm just telling you what I think, that there's greater things that can be accomplished in my life if I would just devote myself a little bit more to Jesus Christ. Amen. If my walk with the Lord would be just a little bit better, I'm telling you, there's no telling what the Lord can do in and through me. But you know what? There's no telling what the Lord can do in and through you if you would just make right decisions for Him. If we would just do some of those things that we had heard about already and put some of those foolish things aside and start picking up our Bibles just a little bit instead of picking up the remote. I don't have time to read. Really, we're following the Masters pretty well, aren't we? Well, I don't have time to read. Really, I know what the, the Oklahoma Thunder are doing. I know this baseball season's picked up. And we, can, uh, we can recite all the stats from all of our favorite players and things of that nature, but we don't have time to read and we don't have time to pray. Hogwash right there. Right. You know why we don't have time to read? We don't have time to pray because we don't want to have time right. to pray. Right. We don't want to have time to pray. You know, if your wife woke up in the morning and saw you even up a little bit earlier, sitting on the recliner with your Bible open, I wonder if she'd have a heart attack. <laughs> Wouldn't that be awesome, though? And so, <laughs> Prepared him 
He would soon become the second in command of all Egypt. I mean, big stuff was around the corner. He just saw it. He just told these two guys what was going to happen to them. And now I'm done when he's getting ready to be elevated. We're going to see the success of that with the next session. He was elevated. And the Lord is going to use this time of solitude to build him and to teach him and to prepare him for this battle. And some might be thinking, well, that's a bummer. You know, I can think of several other ways to prepare for being second in command of, of Egypt. You know, there's going to be other ways than being cast into the prison house. I mean, come on, isn't there like a second in command school of Pharaoh wannabes? You know, I mean, there's got to be a school for that or something. Maybe the Lord could have allowed him to, to serve an apprenticeship or something. I mean, good grief, prison? I mean, there's a, so many other different areas that we could go to. Well, I don't know, though. What's the Lord going to have to do in your life to get you to be compassionate about the things of God? What's he, going to, what's he going to have to do? Because I believe a little bit about the sovereignty of God that Brother Vance was preaching about last night. And I believe that he directs in the affairs of men. And I believe with all my heart that he knows exactly what he's doing in my life. And I also believe that nothing is off the table when it comes to giving me and my walk with the Lord where it needs to be. Did you hear me on that? I don't, I don't, think, I don't think anything is left on the table. I think there's nothing left. I don't know what I'm trying to say. There's nothing left on the table. He can do whatever he wants to do. In mean, your life and in my life, to get us to the point where we need to be. Amen? And that makes, I don't know about you, but that makes me a little nervous. It makes me a little nervous. Man, why is he a judge? No, God is just waiting to strike us down. That's kind of hateful. No, no, no. He is a loving God. He is a wonderful God. And, and, and he's a gracious God and a merciful God. And that is why we're having an end of it. It's encouraging you, imploring you, and begging you. Spend some time with him. Amen. Develop that relationship with him that he wants and he yearns for so dearly. But let's think about Joseph. You know, what's the Lord going to have to do? Think about Joseph. What happened to him while he was in prison? It was here in the prison house for the first time that we see him compassionate towards others. Uh, I, I know he cleaned Potiphar's house, but there's something, he's doing something here for those who can do nothing for him in return. He even tried it. Uh, uh, he even tried it uh, 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 with the uh, chief butler, and, but he forgot him. And so in the prison house here where we first see him interpreting the dreams of the butler and the baker, where these, these dreams, this, this interpretation of dreams are beginning to bud and beginning to be experienced. And we understand that Joseph didn't plan on or look forward to spending in time in solitude apart from his family. He didn't plan on or look forward to being in a dirty dungeon as an innocent prisoner. And quite frankly, he could have handled this a whole lot differently. He could have handled it poorly. But again, we're also reminded of his personal walk and the reason why he didn't handle it poorly and the reason why he didn't handle it in, in a negative way was because he already had the presence of God, the mercy of God, and the favor of God. He was already a godly man going in. He already had his walk with the Lord where it needed to be. We know from verses 21 and 22 that his God's presence and his mercy and his favor was already with Joseph. But I just still have this sinking feeling if you would have pulled Joseph aside and said, hey, how's God's presence? doing for you? How's his favor doing with you? How's his mercy? I don't know that Joseph would have said, man, alive, I can feel it. This is awesome. I've never been in a greater place. No, he had that, although sometimes he just didn't quite feel like it at the time. You know, really being led down, I'm unjustly accused. I'm unjustly accused as he's been put in shackles and led down to the prison house. He says, man, I'm right. I got God's presence and his mercy. Ooh, look at this. And his favor is upon me. No, 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 he had those things, but perhaps didn't even maybe feel like it at the time. And, and some things that weren't, some things aren't, aren't, aren't quite going the way that we think that they ought to go through in our life, and, and you're struggling a little bit, things aren't happening the way that you think they ought to do. When difficulties arise, what are we going to do? Joseph could have quit serving, and, and most guys would have quit had they gone to the prison because of this. But Joseph went as low as you could possibly go while still maintaining his innocence, Innocency, yet he refused to stop trusting God. Uh, what's happening in your life? We could take, we could take uh, questions and say, hey, you know, tell me the problems that are going on in your life. There are more problems than there are people in this room today. I'm just telling you, we're all going through something, aren't we? There's a difficulty. Let me tell you what, let's not maintain our innocency. Or, I mean, let's make certain we maintain our innocency, and let's make certain that we maintain our walk with the Lord all the way through it. Let's make certain that our faith in Jesus Christ is strong and secure. How are we going to get that? Well, Bible reading and prayer time. Bible reading and prayer time. You know, I'm a strong you know, proponent of standards. I love standards. And, and I think that we ought to have standards in our life. But standards are not giving us the power and the holiness of God. We don't get that through our standards. Because so many people rely upon that. To, 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 we don't have the ability to manufacture holiness. Holiness 
uh, of standards are, are brought about. We have standards in our life to help us keep and maintain the holiness that we get through our relationship with God in our Bible reading and our prayer time. And, and so this makes sure our walk with the Lord is where it is be as it pertains to our Bible reading and our prayer time. And so why does God put us in places of solitude? Why does he desire to spend time us to spend time alone with him? Well, it certainly helps us to trust him. One of the great things about places of solitude, it helps us to realize that it's all about him and it's not about me. It is not about me. This world is not about me and my life. It's all about Jesus Christ and serving Amen. him. Maybe you've had something bad happen to you or you have a family member or friend uh, that's gone through a terrible experience and, 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 and difficulties come about. And what's one of the first things that we do? Well, we, we, we run to church. And maybe you lost a job or have troubles with your marriage and troubles with the kids. You're taken to that place of solitude and loneliness in a state of being alone, and instantly, instantly, you knew you needed to get back right with God. And we head back to the church house, don't we? Or we get back into our Bible reading or our prayer time. I tell you what, that's exactly what happened to me at that funeral home. I'm sitting there, hungover, and I'm thinking this guy is still going to come after me because he just left me alone. By it, and he knows where I live. And I, mean, I was scared. And what did I start to do? I started to realize... I mean, no one had to call me up and say, uh, Nail, do you realize that uh, the Lord is trying to get a hold of you for your life? And don't you understand what's going on? No, no, no. The Holy Spirit was telling me, you need to get right with me. And, and you, need to, you need to get right with the Lord. And you need to uh, start serving me and putting me first. And I remember calling my mom and saying, hey, mom, this is like on a Monday even. And I remember calling her and I said, hey, is services on Wednesday still at 7 o'clock? And she said, yes. And I said, I'll be there. And I went to church that night, Wednesday night, and I haven't missed since. And I'm just talking about it. sometimes God has to get us to that point in time where we realize that it's not about me and it's all about Him. But what is it going to take to get us there? What are we willing to sacrifice? Or what are we willing to sacrifice to get to that point? Joseph was taken to a place of solitude to help him trust the Lord. And while he was in that prison house, his personal, intimate relationship with the Lord was only heightened and strengthened. And that's what we need in our life today. But well, why is it so hard to develop that? I, I'm just, come on, guys, let's be honest with you. We can talk about these things and other things, but when we get down, when, when the rubber meets the road, and we commit, okay, I'm going to read my Bible every day, and I'm going to spend time in prayer every day, that's when it gets a little bit difficult, doesn't it? Let's just be honest here. Hey, we hard enough to get commitments to come to Sunday school, you know, from, uh, from, uh, from people, or even tithing and, and things of that nature, giving to missions. But to make a commitment to read our Bibles every day and to spend time in prayer every day, why is it so difficult to do that? It, it, it takes work to do that, doesn't it? Brother Jones mentioned it yesterday. We're so busy that we fail to nurture that quiet time. The devil knows that it's all so important, but we have to discipline ourselves on purpose. I am strong. We have to discipline ourselves, set aside time on purpose to spend time alone with the Lord. We have to do that. I mean, we, we have to say, okay, this is the time I'm going to do it, and we have to set it. You know, one of my goals in life uh, is to lose a little bit of, well, I'm not in life. I mean, I just need to lose some weight. I, I, since I've been here for 16 years, I've gained 65 pounds. Amen. <laughs> that's a small kid right there. That's a small kid I've consumed and have kept on me. And so, uh, and, and so 65 pounds. And so, I mean, I, I tried to run. Uh, I, I ran for a while, and... Uh, uh, and I jogged for a while, and then I had the knee surgery, and that went out. And I, I watched people jog, you know, I watched people run. And, you know, so I, I got a treadmill. Uh, that treadmill uh, was the greatest uh, clothes hanger that we've ever had in our house. And I, on it. I got a stationary bike for a while. Well, that lasted for yeah, a long time. That lasted for a little while, and then Brother Gartland took it back again. And he said, hey, you still using that stationary bike? Um, oh, you need it. No, I get it. I get it back to you. I mean, I've tried and failed, tried and failed, tried and failed. But here's the problem with that. Because of my failing, I still, as a matter of fact, here's our choices. Come here, Brother Garley. Here's our choices this morning. You can either look like this, you know, with a big belly right here, or you can look like someone who works out. You suck that in just now, didn't you? <laughs> So what's the difference? Because, because this man, he's a member of Faith Baptist Church, he works out pretty much every day, don't you? Six days. Six days a week. <laughs> so you can work out not at all. I have stopped drinking pop, though. I mean, that's like, give me some kudos on that. Or you can actually work out. So you see, it's all a matter of discipline. 
isn't it? Isn't it? It's all a matter of wanting to. Do you always enjoy going to the gym? No, no, we don't, do we? Uh, I mean, you don't, do you? <laughs> but, uh, but you do it because you know you need to do it because you want to keep your body fit, you want to be a good testimony and things of that nature, and plus he's an Air Force, in the Air Force, and they require So anyway, uh, <laughs> and so if we were to have a race, if we were going to have a race, let's say those black boxes, we're going to have a race. Uh, who do you think is going to win this race if we, if we have this race? Who, who, who do you think is going to win? The guy that's fit or the guy that's not fit? Well, like, so uh, we're going to go There's guys that cheat, there's, uh, no, there's professional <laughs> players, and, and even players in, you know, even in, the golf, in the golf business, in the golf realm, uh, there, there's, you know, gear hammer stuff and all that. I don't know, there's people out there who are cheating, and some of them are getting caught, but some of them are not getting caught, are they? Some of them are getting caught, and they're getting busted, and they're losing their rewards, and some of them are getting by, and people aren't understanding, and they don't know about that, and none's the wiser. But here's the thing that we need to understand about our spiritual walk with the Lord. There is no cheating when it comes to a personal walk with Jesus Christ. You might be able to cheat in the workplace, and we might be able to cheat out there in the sports field, and we might be able to cut corners and, and, and make it work and look victorious, but if you want to walk, have a personal walk with Jesus Christ where it needs to be, if you want your kids to serve the Lord with gladness, gladness, and you want to have happiness in your home and a right relationship with your spouse and a right relationship with your family and others, with God himself, no cheating is allowed. You're not going to be a, a, able to cheat. You can play the part, and you can make it look that way, but God knows, and heaven will declare it, whether, we're, we're, whether our relationship with Him is where it needs to be or not. No cheating whatsoever. It's just not going to, it's not going to, to, to work. The seduction that Brother Tommy preached about earlier deals with the exterior attacks from the devil, but the solitude that we have with the Lord deals with our internal attitude. You see, we look at the externals out there and they're, they're, they're bombarding us and they're after us, but we have to also deal with the internal, with our relationship, with our walk, with our demeanor. And, and it is so important. It's not enough to say no to those outward advances of the devil. We have to have a right relationship with him, period. We must have that right relationship. And so how can we find that? Again, time with the Lord daily. And it's, we're very strong, again, on those standards, and we're very strong on other, those other things, but we often fail to develop that personal walk, and we must have faith. It is required and for victorious living. The only way that we can have that faith is through a devotion through Jesus Christ and His Word. The honing of our faith, and I think that's right there in our notes, the honing of this faith is developed in our solitude, in our quiet time with the Lord. And if we don't develop that, I'm telling you, if we don't develop it, then the Lord may have to bring other solitude into play. And He does this simply because He wants to use you. Do we understand that this morning? He's working all things together for good in our life, and He is wanting... I, I can't even comprehend. My wife texted me last night, and I talked to her last night. She texted me before I went to bed. She texted me first thing this morning, and, she, and, and just wondering how things are going. Could you imagine if I said, oh, I'm too busy to talk to you? You know, that's one of the phone calls I take. You know, not because I'm fearful of my wife or anything of that nature, but I just love my wife. And I just want to make sure, hey, sweetie, how's it going? Is everything going well? Okay, hey, I'll call you back. I'm in a meeting. Uh, yeah, hold on just a second. You know. no, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I, I, can, I can't imagine not, have, not, not having a relationship with my wife on a daily basis and speaking with her. But there's someone that we say we love even more than our spouse. Right. And yet we're willing, I think Brother Jones mentioned it very eloquently last night. He's all more than willing to be there for us. But we're not very willing sometimes to be there for him. I said it a little bit better, but it's the same, same gist of the situation right there. God wants to use us. Listen, men, he wants to use us to accomplish great things in our life. He, he, why are we here at this men's advance? And I, and I appreciate the testimonies from years gone by. And men, there's men, even at Faith Baptist Church, have been changed. Their lives have been different since they've come to a men's advance. And the Lord really used that and got a hold of their heart. You know what, that we're realizing and understanding that God wants to use you in a great and mighty way. We're not here just for the fun skits, and we're not here for uh, this or that, and the golf tournament and all this. We're here because we believe with all of our heart that God wants to do something great and mighty in your life. 
in the life of your family and the life of your children. But it begins with you and your personal commitment to Him. Are we going to get into our books? Are we going to get into the Bible? Are we going to spend time in prayer? It all begins with you. And I look at how awesome Joseph was as a, a young boy, you know, the favorite of his father, coat, a cool coat, and or cool shorts his brother Ross was wearing around. He received dreams from the Lord about his future. He was even treated well by Potiphar for a period of time there, treated well by the prison guards, but he wasn't quite ready. As we look at his life in prison, he wasn't quite ready for the glory of Pharaoh. He wasn't quite ready to face his brothers. He wasn't quite ready for that. That's going to take place. You know, he's going to interpret dreams for Pharaoh, and then ultimately, this is all prepared. So that, what a picture of Jesus Christ. So we can see the forgiveness of his brothers and the restoration there. But he wasn't quite ready for that before he went into prison. He, he, he wasn't ready to stand before Pharaoh. He wasn't ready to stand before his brothers. He wasn't ready for the glory of Pharaoh or his brothers until God pulled him aside and worked in his life a time of solitude. You see, you have to be able to stand alone before you can stand before others. And some might be thinking, well, that's all great and fine, but we're talking about Joseph here. You know, we're talking about a great man of the faith, one of the, one of the patriarchs, you know. But we, we could never be used like Joseph was used. But again, we have to go back into our text here. The, the little secret about all of this solitude and the Lord wanting to do great things and, and through us is the fact that we already have what Joseph had. We already have that today. As a born again believer, you already have God's presence right there. Look at verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph. You know who's with me and who's with you today? Our Heavenly Father. Our Lord is with us. We, are, we already have God's mercy right now. We have Him. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed Him mercy. I have that. I have God's mercy. I have His grace. And, and we have God's favor right now. Let me tell you what I want of His children. I'm a joint heir to the throne of God with His Son, Jesus Christ. You tell me I'm not important in the sight of God? And so we already have all these wonderful things. But one of the things that we don't have from time to time, one of those things that we don't have that Joseph did have is that most necessary item called solitude. That item called solitude. Either you develop, listen guys, and I'll finish up here. Either you develop this time alone with the Father on your own or be prepared to find it by necessity. You're either going to develop this on your own or you're going to get to a point in time when you're like, okay, I'm in trouble. And maybe I should have started, I'm 46 years of age, I'm thinking, man, I should have been working on this a little bit longer, you know, a lot, lot, long ago. Because now it's getting even worse and it's getting more difficult. But mark it down, listen to this, the seeds of failure in your life and in my life, and even in the life of our family, are sown in the lack of solitude. The seeds of failure are sown in the lack of solitude. If you want to be truly used by God today, and I can't imagine anyone standing up saying, I don't want to be used by God, I'm just here because of the food. I, no one wants to not be used by God. If you truly want to know His direction for you, for your family, and for your ministry, don't you want to know, you know, I just don't know what God wants me to do. He'll tell you, He'll give you direction, He'll show you, then you must be uh, willing to spend time alone with Him in our prayer body. You know, it's a little awkward, you know, this meeting's not about us going to Phoenix, and it's not about all that, you know, if this meeting's about preaching God's word and changing the hearts of men, that's what this meeting is all about. And I appreciate the comments, and that's very fine, and there's no secret that we're moving to, to fair, or fair, there's no secret that we're moving to Phoenix, and uh, uh, as we're contemplating this move, let me just close with this illustration, as we were contemplating this move, um, Dean and I had visited the area, and we were doing a lot of talking about this move. You know, about, oh, what, is the Lord in this? And we're trying to find, listen, we're talking about uprooting family. You know, and we're talking about moving from all that we've known for 16 years and family. Uh, this is, you know, church family and, and friends, and, and uh, this is big stuff here. Right. And, you know, we're like, okay, I don't know, we're talking about this and seeking God's face. And, and on the plane home, as we were talking about this or that, boy, you know, the wife, how she can be making me so big and spiritual discerning, you know, on this. And, and on the way home, on the plane, we were talking about this, and I don't know, you know, if the Lord would have this. And, and Dina made this comment. She says, I don't know. She says, I don't know. I've not heard a firm commitment out of you yet. That's what she said. She said, I don't know. I've not said. I've not heard you say, because I would say, you know, well, we'd have to do this, and we'd have to do that. And it's all fun to talk about, it, isn't it? But making a commitment's a whole other story. Amen. And on the plane, on the right home, she said, I don't know. I think we just need to stop talking about this because you, as a, she didn't say these words, but as a leader of our home, you, husband, have not made a firm commitment yet. I haven't heard it from your lips, is what she was saying. 
And so I said, here's what I said to her, and it's not because I'm some spiritual giant or anything like this, but here's what I, here's what I just know in my life. And here's what we all need to understand in our own lives. I told her this. I said, I just need time to spend alone with the Lord. That was all I said. I said, I just, I just need time to be here. I just need time to spend alone with the Lord. Because we were traveling. And, and I had been, I was, I was preaching. And, and, you know, and I had my prayer time. Uh, you know, and I was reading my Bible. I was preaching out. You know, you just go, well, I'm preaching. I don't have to pray. And I don't have to read. I mean, I had my prayer time. And I had my Bible reading. While I was preaching out in, in, in Tucson and in Phoenix and, and when we were in the other places uh, at Dallas. And, and but what I was saying was I need to get alone with God in some solitude. With no one else, with no other with no other things out there pressing upon me or no other requirements out there, just me and the Lord on my knees and even my Bible opened up. And I did just that. I got into my office. Amen. We landed I, on Monday night. And I got in my office on Tuesday and I shut the door and I just, it was just me and the Lord. And I was beginning to pray and I said, Lord, I just need direction here. And this is what I'm talking about. This is what the whole session is about right here. Practical stuff. I said, Lord, I need direction in my life. And I'm opening up my heart. I didn't come to him with a grocery list of things. It was just me and him and I was just silently listening and just waiting and just having that quiet time with the Lord. And I opened up my Bible and turned to Psalm 70, uh, 90, uh, 74. Turn to Psalm 74, because you know what? I believe the Lord has answers in His Word. I think He can show us in His Word what He wants us to do. So I turned to Psalm 74, and I was just reading. I said, Lord, help me. And, and I don't think, I'm not one of these. I, I don't think it's biblical, to be honest with you, uh, you know, to just say, Lord, I need direction. You know, oh, there. There, okay, this one can do it. And, uh, and Judas went and hanged himself. You know? <laughs> Nothing. Nope, I didn't do anything. Okay. I'm laying here, believe it or not, tears streaming down my face, and, and I'm, I have not shared this with anyone. And uh, I'm reading not nothing Psalm 74. I keep reading. I don't know. So I just keep reading Psalm 75, Psalm 76, Psalm 77. Get one side. <laughs> get a little hungry here. But no, I'm going to keep on reading. I, I need to find some answers. Man, we need to find some direction from the Lord for our life. And the Lord's going to speak to you differently than he's going to speak to me, but he just gave me what I needed. You might think it's kind of corny. You might need to move because of that. But one of the things that I was struggling with about this whole move is going from having a blessing in a faith of this church to going out and Lord willing preaching to my wife and kids. You know, I, I, you know, I'm just a little bit like, what? Dina needs the preaching, I'm just saying. You know? <laughs> and so... It's not even the money. It's not God's going to take care of my needs. And yeah, I'm not going to do that. But I'm just like, okay, um, we've been there and done that you know, when we started Faith Baptist. And I'm like, I don't know. I'm going to have to, my two boys are going to have to be ushers. And Jenna probably play the same hymn Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. to take piano yeah, lessons. I'm like, okay, I don't know about this. And uh, so I, that's where I was the concern about. It's like, heck, you know, and, and leaving everything. And so I get to Psalm 76, Psalm 77, I get to Psalm 78, and I find verse 19 talking about the children of Israel murmuring against God, and he says, Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Can God take care of my needs? I'm, I'm just reading, and I get down verse 53, he led them on safely so that they feared not. I know he's not talking about me moving the Phoenix. I know he's talking about the children of Israel and they're complaining and they're backbiting and all these other things. But I'm telling you what, the Lord spoke to my heart that day. And how would I have known that had I not spent some time alone Amen. with the Lord? Amen. So busy. We're so busy. Man, you're so, we got this going on, we got that going on, we got this going on. We better spend some time alone with the Lord. Your family, your wife deserves it. Your kids, they need it. You mean the Lord deserves it. Yeah. Bible reading and prayer time. Don't tell me you don't have time. Tell me that you're willing to make that time. Yeah. Father, thank you for this again. Thank you for your love for us. And thank you for your